Whole CEO with Lisa G. I'm the best-selling author of The Boss Weight Loss. I'm bringing you the top tips to be unstoppable. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to actually pull up a chair with today's top experts in weight loss, mindset, and business. Learn our top tips to set you up for success so that you can have more energy, be fit and resilient, and feel unstoppable. Hey you guys, I'm so excited. We're here with Eric Maisel. Hey Eric. Hi, nice to be with you. I'll just give you guys a little bit of scoop about Eric and we'll jump right into the content. He's America's foremost creativity coach, is a former psychotherapist, active creativity coach, and critical psychology advocate. He writes the Rethinking Mental Health blog for Psychology Today with 2 million views. Lectures nationally, internationally, provides keynotes for organizations, and has authored more than 50 books. So Eric, I'm really excited to jump into some of these mental health topics with you and how it pertains to health and fitness. So let's jump in with a little bit about your story and how did you get involved with doing all this? Well, it's a long story now. Um, I started out as a math and science boy. That, that didn't interest me after a while. When I got out of the army, I had no idea what I was doing, so I got a degree in philosophy. So my background was originally in philosophy. Then I was a fiction writer and a ghost writer for a long time. I've been writing books for a long time. At some point, that wasn't making enough money, so I retooled as a therapist, and I worked with creative performing artists exclusively. Then I stopped believing in the therapy model and I became a coach. And I've been coaching creative and performing artists for 30, 35 years now. I love that. I, I feel similarly myself, although I'm sure my mother who's a therapist wouldn't agree. <laughs> but I, I think that action steps are what I'm all about with this podcast. And I wanna help our audience have the action steps to start thinking thoughts that serve. So do you have something you wanna talk about with that? Sure. Uh, people know a lot about negative self-talk and thoughts that pester themselves and what have you. What they're less clear about is that even a true thought may not serve you, that there are a lot of true thoughts we think that we ought not to countenance because they're not serving us. So what do I mean? Let's say you're a writer and you, you walk into a bookstore and you say to yourself, wow, there are a lot of writers out there. That's a true That's thought. True. <laughs> That's true. true. But it doesn't serve you to think it because you'll probably three days later stop writing and you won't even know why you stopped writing this because all that competition got to you without you even knowing it. So we want to be smart about disputing those thoughts that don't serve us, even if they're true thoughts. So you wouldn't say to that thought, no, no thought, you're not true. Because it is, it is a true, true thought, yeah. You say no thought, I don't want you because you're not serving me. So there's a simple three-step process, but it's really a smart process that cognitive therapists teach. And it's hear what you say to yourself. That's number one. And that's scary. You know, we're tricky creatures. We don't want to hear what we're saying to ourselves. We don't want to hear that we just ate those three cupcakes. And, you know, we don't want to, there's a lot of stuff we don't want to hear. But that's number one, hear. Be brave and hear. Second is dispute those thoughts that don't serve you. Say no to them. I don't want to say it as loudly as I might say it in real life. I'd scare your audience, but it's a really a loud no that you want to say, no thought, you're not serving me. And then the, the third step is to substitute more affirmative language, to just have some kind of global affirmation, something you always say to yourself that keeps yourself up, keeps yourself uplifted and enthusiastic and affirmative because there's plenty of stuff to get us down, more stuff that we can count to get us down. So we have to do our own internal job of, of keeping ourselves up while we're alive, we need to do the work that we need to do while we're alive. So we have to keep ourselves lively and enthusiastic by monitoring our self-talk. I agree. I have decided to give my automatic negative thinking in my head a name, changing my name to Lucy, because we all have those automatic negative thoughts. And I want to encourage people to have a positive growth mindset instead of a negative fixed mindset too. Yeah, we need it. We, we need it because 
it's crazy to think that each of us has the job of saving the world, but kind of we do. Because we, if, if we're not doing it, who's doing it? And if, if that's our job, if we're, if we're wearing that kind of heavy weight, we have to keep ourselves um, lively and enthusiastic and curious and all those other words while we're trying to save the world. And the mantra stuff is really helpful too. That's like a great actionable step because I learned after all the ups and downs that I've been through in my life, which have been many, that was actually my inspiration to start this podcast so I can inspire other people. And, and nothing's easy and stuff obviously always is going to happen. So it's just how you deal with it that matters. Yeah, let me, let me piggyback since you like mantras. I, I did a book called 10 Zen Seconds and the 10 of that title is a, one long deep breath, five seconds on the inhale, five seconds on the exhale. And the idea of that book, a simple idea, but it's a good idea. And that's the idea of dropping a useful phrase, some good thought into a deep breath, it's sort of combining the benefits of deep breathing with the benefits of right thinking. And so it's sort of like affirmations in a breath, but the breath component's important. So even if a person already has it, uses affirmations, adding this little bit of dropping the affirmation into a breath, thinking half of it on the inhale, half of it on the exhale, can be really important, it can be a really added benefit, get the physiological benefits of the deep breathing and the psychological benefits of the right thinking. I feel it already, like even as we sit here speaking, the more I breathe, the more I realize that whenever I'm anxious and stressed, I realize I'm not even breathing at all. So it just, it really helps, I think, to tune in, check in with your breathing at the time when you're planting in that mantra. And I make myself have those thoughts before I'm allowed to get out of the bed instead of starting the day, thinking whatever stuff already happened in the past, just moving in the wrong direction. I want to move forward. So I'll plant two or three positive thoughts in my head before I'm allowed to get out of the bed. And I love your actionable steps in the 10 second with the five and five is super helpful. Mm -hmm. And can we talk a little bit about thinking thoughts that serve and life purpose versus life purpose? Because I know everyone has their life purpose, but do you want to elaborate on the life purpose? Yeah, the, the distinction there is between life purpose in the singular, like the purpose of life versus life purposes in the plural. And I, I think there is a movement that a person can make from kind of what's an old fashioned idea that keeps you chasing around the universe. The idea of finding a life purpose makes you go look for the next guru or come up, go, go up some big mountain or go to Tibet or something, chase that life purpose. The movement from that to the, the idea that we make our life purpose choices and that we don't have to imagine that we have just one life purpose, but that we have multiple life purposes. Lots of things are important to us. When we make that menu of life purpose choices, that helps us really understand what is important to us and how to organize our life around those life purposes. When it comes to fitness and health, we can't really say that's the purpose of life. That feels too highfalutin to say that. But we can say it's one of our life purposes. As soon as you get the idea of life purposes, that actually elevates our, our desire to work on weight or health or whatever it is that we want to work on. So there's, there's actually a big distinction between still chasing that life purpose thing, seeking, seeking rather than choosing and making decisions about what our life purposes are. I love that. You know, that's a great distinction because I think so many times we're always trying to find what our life purpose is. And it so takes me off the hook thinking yep. there's more than one life purpose. And to me, health and wellness is something that I believe in helping people live a better life, live longer through health and wellness. But it's not all that I am in any way, exactly. shape or form. And there are probably only about 20 categories of life purposes that matter to human beings, relationships, service, activism, creativity, health. You know, we could name what they are. Spirituality, I think it is. Exactly, important. but it's a finite number and it's really pretty easy to create your own list of life purposes. For most people, it'll be a list that's five or six or seven items long, but then you know what you're actually after in life. Once you've made that list, you have a much better sense of what you're actually after. And then you can negotiate each day around those life purposes as opposed to just 
to-do lists and chores and responsibilities and what have you, you can actually ask yourself the question, which of my life purposes did I get to today? And you know, which will I get to tomorrow? It's really a different way of organizing a day and a life. And I think it's a better way of organizing a life. I love that because I think so many of us in this day and age are suffering from ADD and we're just moving from one social media to the next social media. And sometimes I'll walk into a room and I'll be like, why am I even here? And I, and it would (laughs) help me to bring it all back to, is this activity serving one of my purposes or is this just waste of time? Yeah. I want to say that one thought there, it's a really a big idea. It's, It's hard to say it super quickly, but I'll try. Um, To my mind, again, there's nothing to search for with respect to meaning either. Meaning is like purpose. Meaning is just a certain kind of psychological experience and not something to chase as if it were out there somewhere too. And once you get this idea that meaning is just a psychological experience, then, then you can learn how to create more of it and coax it into existence. But a big point here is lots of things we do in the service of meaning don't feel meaningful. They just don't. If you're slogging through writing your novel on a given day, the activity of writing that novel may not feel meaningful at all, but it's still in the service of your meaning needs. So that that helps you understand why you're doing it on days when you don't feel like doing it and when it doesn't feel good to do it. I love that. I love that thought. I know you're still going, but to me, I think that's really super helpful to um, not have to really be responsible to enjoy the moment all the time. That's right. And, and to, and to re, sort of remind ourselves why this sloggy hard work is worth doing. Because if we don't remember why it's worth doing, we're going to flee the encounter. We're going to get out of there. We're not going to do that work. And for you know, most of my creative performing artist clients who come to me, they stop doing their work at a certain point, And then two years and five years and 19 years slip by without wow. them getting their work done. And that, that's yeah. disappointing, and, and it, it, that's not okay to have all that time slip by. So we really have to remind ourselves that the task is to show up and not to attach to outcomes and not to care if it's feeling meaningful or not. We just need to show up to the work. Commitment. I love it. And just um, avoiding the resistance of trying to think it has to be perfect. Like, that's something that messes people up, don't you think? Absolutely. People have... To, Everybody has an intellectual understanding that it's okay to make mistakes and messes. They just don't feel it in their body. It doesn't feel okay in their body. They don't have a visceral permission to make those mistakes and messes. And that's a a super big movement from just the, the intellectual idea, which we all get sure it's possible to make mistakes, to actually being able to make those mistakes, to feeling okay about making those mistakes and to and to understand the realities of process, that only a percentage of the things we do are going to turn out okay takes a lot of a lot of maturity to understand that only a percentage of the things we do will turn out okay as opposed to having this wishful thinking belief that everything we touch is going to be gold which is ridiculous i've felt forward enough to know that that's part of my inspiration in being here and i got inspired by kobe bryant who i looked up to so much as such a hero that he fell forward and he got up every day and and took a step and it's everything is going to happen to all of us. Stuff's going to happen, but it's just how do we deal with it? How do I, how do we pick ourselves up, fill forward and not get caught up in beating yourself up about stuff that already happened? Yeah. And for creative folks, it's more than stuff will happen. It's really understanding that maybe only 20% of what you do will be any good. That's really hard to tolerate that thought, but that's the truth of the matter. I mean, how many of Bob Dylan's five trillion songs are excellent? 28, 32, 46. It's some percentage of the whole. It's not the whole. And that's true for even the most creative folks. Only a percentage of what they do is excellent. It's hard hard for most people to understand and accept that idea, but it's the truth. That's brilliant. So stop chasing perfection and done is better than perfect. And I just want one more topic that I want to talk to you about. And this is an interesting topic to me about redecorating your mind. I love that concept. Yeah, you know, cognitive therapists focus on thinking, I mean, on on the thoughts that come up for us, but not on where the thoughts come from. They don't really understand or they don't get at 
what the experience of thinking is like. And to my mind, it's like being in a certain kind of room, the, the room that is your mind, that there's, there's really a place we go to when we think. And with that metaphor in mind, we can redecorate that room that is our mind. We can add windows and let a breeze come through, or there are lots of that we can substitute our bed of nails for an easy chair. And you know, we can make changes and it's only a metaphor and it's only a kind of visualization. But despite the fact that it's only a metaphor, it can be really useful to imagine that, you're, that, you could, that your mind's in your control. The Buddha said, get a grip on your mind. This is one way to get a grip on your mind is to actually change the wallpaper and add windows and add an easy chair and add the things you actually want to be in there and get rid of the things you don't need. That's super helpful. I really appreciate all the wonderful, actual steps that you've been giving our audience. And where can people find you? Um, myname.com, ericmazel.com. That's E-R-I-C-M-A-I-S-E-L.com. That's simple enough. And I will have everybody reach out to you there. And thank you for joining us. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining me at Whole CEO with Lisa G. This episode is brought to you by Boise Wine. Boise Wine is served by biodynamically farmed so that it's more organic and it's one of my favorites, this bottle by Boise and John Legend's Sparkling French Rosé. Join me in my wine society. Click on the website below to get a 20% discount when you become a member.